in this episode. I don't want it, you know, but I can't live without it, right? This is something that many people say about the symptom. And the way to address it uh, is, well, the effect that might produce a change uh, on that level is an effect on the level of the body. It's a way uh, to address this satisfaction that we cannot do without and produce a change in the way that we produce it. <laughs> So this is why every analysis, much more than any type of intellectual experience, it is not an intellectual experience. Well, it, at least this is not the, the direction of the treatment in most of, it, of, of most of the time, aims at a change on the level of the body and the level of the libidinal body and the level of the drive, uh, on the level of this repetition of satisfaction, I think that only when one experiences change on that level, one is truly, let's say, convinced or familiar uh, with the effect of psychoanalysis. This is where you start seeing people becoming very passionate, uh, not in terms of, you know, uh, adoring or being a fan of uh, of the theory of the idea of these imaginal imaginary ideals that we might have about an analysis uh, one is convinced because it works hey everyone welcome to this conversation that i had with dr leona sprenner uh practicing psychoanalyst and psychoanalytical theorist uh, this is the second conversation I had with him. Uh, he is the author of this book, The Autistic Subject, which I discussed previously, not only in the episode I had with him, but also in a couple of other uh, podcast episodes. It's an excellent book, uh, especially uh, if you're a neophyte like myself. I have to admit, it's, it's a difficult book to read. It's, it's a very theoretical text, but it's an excellent introduction or even prelude to some of the more uh, deeper uh, concepts in Lacan and, and psychoanalysis. In general, uh, un unsurprisingly, unsurprisingly, this was a very enlightening, uh, educational conversation for me. Certainly, at least within the domain of psychoanalysis, this was the most theoretical podcast that I've done. Uh, well, at least for me, as a neophyte, I felt like we delved deep into some of these ideas and concepts uh, within the field. We discuss the subjective structures or the clinical structures uh, delineated by Freud and Lacan, a neurosis, perversion, psychosis, and of course, uh, what Leon's been developing in his work, uh, autism being a separate mode of being or uh, subjective structure. And as he highlights in the podcast, it has to be treated as such. Uh, the clinic has to develop uh, a, a practice or a praxis uh, on dealing with uh, individuals who are autistic subjects or having the subjective structure of autism. But above all, uh, perhaps the part that I love the most, uh, unsurprisingly, is when we discuss love. And I was even more elated to hear that Leo has been working on a book uh, on delineating a theory of love through the work of uh, Lacan and Bajou, again, two of my favorite theorists on love. Uh, yeah, I, I, honestly, we, we, we discussed a lot of things, so uh, I think it's a, it was a worthwhile uh, of Leon's time. Hopefully, I made it worthwhile of his time. He's been very generous with his time, uh, especially given all the projects he's working on. Uh, but anyway, this is too much of a, too much of a prolonged introduction. Uh, without further ado, let's get to the podcast. However, a bit of a, a formal introduction. Dr. Leon Esprena is a psychoanalyst and psychoanalytical theorist. His work focuses on the integration of philosophical and linguistic frameworks in the psychoanalytic theory of subjectivity and the understanding of the relationship between culture and psychopathology. He is a co-founder of Unconscious Berlin and his latest book on psychoanalysis of autism is called The Autistic Subject on the Threshold of Language, where he presents a novel account of autistic subjectivity from a Lacanian psychoanalytical perspective. And of course, as I mentioned, uh, you could go uh, visit or check out his previous, our, our previous conversation too, where we discuss more on, on 
a similar topic. So it was perhaps more of an introduction. And, and in this podcast, we went more into detail on Lacan, language, and autism in psychoanalysis. Having said that, here's my conversation with Dr. Leonis Brenner. Kappa, is he? Excellent. A kappa. Uh, mm-hmm. Now, the reason, the reason I stopped you before was because uh, before you started explaining what the course was about, I wanted, I wanted to start recording first. I didn't want to miss out that part. <laughs> so, uh, but now, uh, so it, it's about the, uh, the, the four, four structures of psychoanalysis, isn't it? Or, or the, the four subjective structures, what you're doing with the theory on the ground guys. Yes. Yes. So it's a very wide topic and, um, uh, there's much we can do and the content of the course will depend on the people joining. Uh, I've spoken to Dave, who's in charge of Theory Underground, and uh, we've agreed that the course will be more of a discussion uh, than uh, a lecture. Uh, So in this sense, uh, we'll get uh, wherever the students would like to get. So I'm kind of excited about this because I do this usually in a university in a smaller form with a few students. And uh, it would be nice to try it in this type of, you know, international uh, online group uh, format. So I think those that, that are really interested in delving deeply into these topics that might interest them uh, would benefit the most from this course. Because, you know, other other courses, let's say lectures, you can find on YouTube later. So it's not so important to participate live. It's, it's fun, but... Uh, it's, it doesn't make such a big difference, but this course, I think, will be mostly about the interaction, uh, and I think it will not go online after, so that's um, that makes it quite unique. Yeah, it, it keeps it nice and intimate and private, isn't it? And how do you mm-hmm. find uh, teaching online, uh, especially uh, since the pandemic? It's been quite a, quite a new phenomenon. I mean, pe- there's always been online learning, but I feel like it really um, amplified after the pandemic, yeah. you find something like discussing psychoanalysis a bit more challenging uh, online or do you prefer in person? <laughs> you know, it's this, you can ask the same question about uh, psychotherapy. Many psychotherapists now uh, work online. Um, mm. uh, it, yeah, there is definitely an, a dimension to the body that is absolutely lacking. Uh, technology is not enabled us to uh, supplement it. So um, yeah, I would always take a in-person session, in-person, in-person course <clears throat> over any uh, online uh, discussion. Uh, but uh, the capacity to meet so many interesting people from all around the world, that's something quite amazing. And I've been doing lectures in in of course in Europe in the US but also in Asia and in in Africa and I had the opportunity to meet people that you know it would be so difficult to fly all the way to uh, let's say to India uh, Mm -hmm. just to give uh, an hour and a half lecture but now I can do it and when I do it I meet a lot of interesting people who become colleagues and even friends later so I think that's a huge benefit uh, for this shift towards the digital. No, indeed, indeed. Especially for, I, I find like I'm, I'm, I'm a complete neophyte at this. I never, I don't have any, I, I studied computer science, so I have no academic training. And, mm-hmm. you know, which is why I'm really grateful for platforms like Theory Underground and what Dave and Mikey and they're doing. Because mm-hmm. uh, when I started reading Zizek, uh, so uh, M- Michael, Mikey, he, his blog, uh, the dangerous, uh, the dangerous, maybe I think, was what I used initially to make sense of mm-hmm. my mm-hmm. because he had he had written so many blog posts, and I was mm-hmm. like, this stuff is unbelievable. Like, I, I'm well, why isn't this more accessible? But you know, thanks to the internet, I guess it is. So, and then of course I came across uh, your work. So, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, uh, I shall leave a, a link to the autistic subject in the description down below. It's going to be on the 20 28th starting on the 28th so it's great this podcast will be out end of this week so we should definitely have time to, to give it a bit of a plug oh. um yeah. great uh leon uh, in, in fact i'm glad you mentioned the body because uh this is a great segue um I, I don't know if you recall but in our previous conversation 
I ask from you, um, why is it that language is so critical for Lacan and Lacanians? And then uh, you uh, put this caveat, and, and, and I quote, you said, uh, it, it is how language impacts the body that is at stake. And then you said, let's park that for, for a while and we'll get to that later, but we ran out of time. So now we have the time. Uh, but yeah, I guess to, to put it simply, Leon, the question would be, uh, what's the relationship between uh, language and the body? And why is it, why do you even say, you know, it's that, that relationship that is at stake over purely like language in an abstract sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, one might say, be careful what you wish for. So I wish to speak about it, but be careful. Um, yes, because this is something that is um, <clears throat> posed as a, a point of critique um, of Lacan's teaching, uh, as though Lacan excludes the body from the ex equation, as though the body is not there. Uh, you know, even uh, one... Uh, moves to the couch, it does not look uh, at the analyst, the analyst does not look at, at, at the patient, it's like the body is not there at all. Hmm? And um, if we go and go very early in Lacan's teaching, uh, maybe particularly to his work on the mirror stage, uh, which many people know, and I'm sure you, you also are acquainted with, um, you see that for Lacan, when he speaks about the human body, he speaks about it as some type of um, a mirage, an imaginary construct. The body image, he says. He says, yes, surely we situate ourselves in the world, in a body. It is the body that is in the world, in the three-dimensional world, uh, uh, next to something, beyond something, uh, whenever the subject is situated, is situated in a body. But for Lacan, the body is uh, a, an imaginary construct that um, we uh, delude ourselves to believe is um, some type of a whole, not whole with an age, but a, a wholeness. Yeah, H O L E. Uh, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and it's true, you know, when you make, uh, let's, say, let's call it, when you make love to someone, if you enjoy it, uh, you might say, I'm enjoying their body. I'll be a bit skeptical here. But for the sake of our discussion, you say it. Uh, and you say, well, uh, they're very attractive. Something about them was just right we call it chemistry right uh, on the other hand some people uh, report that uh, when they uh, <clears throat> start uh, the process of love making it is the horrific aspects of the body that come to the fore the fact that the body is stinky that it's full of fluids and these fluids are disgusting, that there is a digestive system, that there is blood and piss and shit everywhere. Hmm? This is the human body, a sack full of uh, hoses, full of liquid, um, a machine that produces uh, feces uh, by ingesting food. Huh? And uh, when you make love to some, someone, this is not what is at stake. Huh? We, in a way, are able to not pay attention to it and focus on this idealized whole body. Uh, but the fact that um, this is uh, established only when we are able to um, forget about the other aspect shows you that, well, the body, as we speak about it, not the horrific body, not the horrifying uh, body, is a fantasy, is a product of a fantasy. So, you know, for Lacan, we're interested in fantasies, but we're not so interested in constructing fantasies, but maybe deconstructing them. 
So one might say, oh, Lacan has nothing to do with the body, because for Lacan, the body is an imaginary construct. He speaks about it in terms of the body image, the ideal ego. <clears throat> That's true. We put that on one hand, but uh, we have to remember that <clears throat> this is one conception of the body as a necessary uh, phantasmatic entity that enables uh, our being situated in the world, interacting with other people who have bodies, making love. Hmm? Uh, but in the psychoanalysis, there is an, another dimension to the body um, that, let's say, um, maybe precedes the formation of the fantasy. And this is the libidinal body, the body of the drives. Uh, it is what Freud says is not on the level of ideation, like any product of a fantasy, but then not on the level of, let's say, the crude organismic body, if we can speak about it at all. He says it's something on the threshold between them. When he speaks about the drive, about the libido, it's something in between. Uh, and this is what we're interested in psychoanalysis in terms of the effect, of the psychoanalytic effect, of the effect of an analysis. Yes, there's a certain dimension we might say of enlightenment in an analysis, one realizes, one remembers, one has some insights. But Freud says this quite clearly, even if you have an insight or realization, that doesn't mean that it will have an effect. You realize, oh, I only, uh, uh, I only date uh, very tall women because uh, my mother was uh, a giant. <laughs> okay. But that does not mean that anything will change in your life, even if you realize that. Hmm? Um, so psychoanalysis aims at <clears throat> change on the level of the body, on the level of the drive. Hmm? And this is one of the major questions that one would ask in an analysis, and maybe later on in an analysis, because in the beginning, you go through a process of a certain enlightenment, then maybe a certain disenchantment. Uh, but then the question is, what to do with the drive? The drive is what repeats. Uh, it repeats again and again, providing us with a satisfaction. And, you know, an analysis begins when one says there is a problem with the way they have uh, produced a satisfaction. It doesn't work for them uh, anymore. <clears throat> and one comes to analysis and they say, um, I don't want it, you know, but I can't live without it. Right? This is something that many people say about the symptom. And the way to address it uh, is, well, the effect that might produce a change uh, yeah, on that level is an effect on the level of the body. It's a way uh, to address this satisfaction that we cannot do without and produce a change in the way that we produce it. <laughs> so this is why every analysis, much more than any type of intellectual experience, it is not an intellectual experience, well, it at least this is not the, the direction of the treatment in most of, of, of most of the time, aims at a change on the level of the body and the level of the libidinal body and the level of the drive, uh, on the level of this repetition of satisfaction. I think that only when one experiences change on that level, one is truly, let's say, convinced or familiar uh, with the effect of psychoanalysis. This is where you start seeing people becoming very passionate, uh, not in terms of, you know, uh, adoring or being a fan of, uh, of the theory, of the idea, of these imaginal, imaginary ideals that we might have about an analysis, uh, 
one is convinced because it works. Hmm? <clears throat> Take it away, Raoul. So, uh, so a really naive question, Leon. I mean, um, it, would it be okay? Uh, again, I'm I'm quite a, I'm a neophyte here, so a naive question. As in, yeah. it, it works. That means in a psychoanalytical session, the the an analysis and like a symptom could be a, a literal physically in their body something, some growth or something that there's there's a change. And I think even Freud talks about this one patient where like, in her throat, or had a dream, I think. I don't know. Regardless. Um, and then once they go through the session, the, the the symptom will stop showing in the body. And is that kind of a sign that the uh, the, the, the sessions were effective? Yeah. Look, it is a sign, but here we're not speaking about the same body. Mm -hmm. It is a sign, yes, but you know, the throat, and specifically with Dora's case, she had uh, a cough, let's say, uh, and Freud um, interprets it as having to do with some symptom that she adopted. Uh, <clears throat> and this happens particularly when her K is not around. And so you see here a certain uh, interpretation that has to do with the level of the deformation on the body, on the throat. This is more of what we would call the body as we perceive it imagine in an imaginary way, how we imagine it. The symptom locates itself on particular places on the body. So one might have a heartache and we would make an interpretation here that uh, would create a certain mobilization. Uh, <clears throat> but the body that I speak about is, um, let's say, a, a bit more abstract. Uh, it's less more con it's more con less concrete than the throat. I speak about a body that is composed of the oral, the anal, the scopic, the invocatory drives. Uh, it's the libidinal body. Um, Lacan, I think in seminar eleven, speaks about it as a montage of the drives. He speaks about the different drives. And, you know, for Freud, there is the oral, anal. Then for Freud, there's the phallic as well, genital, and also a point where drive functions a bit differently. Lacan adopts that. At a certain point, he drops the phallic. The phallus for him is something that is less uh, partial, let's say, in its, in its uh, essence. And he adds the drive that has to do with uh, the gaze as its object, and then the drive that has to do with the voice as its object. So Lacan is interested in the orifices of the body as the source, sources for the partial drive. By the way, my latest work uh, has to do with the skin. And uh, this is where I sort of hypothesize the skin as another source of the partial drive. So I think about it uh, in these terms. But let's think about the oral, anal, scopic, and invocatory. These are the classic uh, drives, partial drives. And you know, for Freud, the drive <clears throat> precedes, uh, the drive, the libido, precedes uh, the formation of the ego. They function prior to any type of localization within a self and within an imaginary body. Because I told you, the ego has two prototypical elements. Let's say the ideal ego having to do with the body image and the ego ideal having to do with one's placement in the humanized world that is full of meaning, that is, uh, the world of social relations, of intersubjective relationships, etc. Um, so the drive operates prior to the formation of these. Prior to the throat, prior to the existence of the throat, there is a drive. Uh, and Freud says that the drive fixates at an early time in one's life. And at the moment that it fixates, it operates in a particular way. It's sort of stuck in its development and doesn't budge and keeps on repeating, repeating, repeating a constant force, as Freud says. Uh, Lacan speaks uh, of the body, the libidinal body, as a certain montage composed of these circuits of drive satisfaction 
uh, that have to do with each of the partial drives. So again, this is only an illustration. You can imagine a, a, a this uh, strange monster that is composed of the oral circuit, the anal circuit, the scopic circuit, the invocatory circuit, and they all have fixated at different points in life for different people. They all operate a bit differently for different people. The, the montage is different. So each person is, uh, well, perverse in their own way, let's say. They, we get off in a different way. I was telling you, I'm a bit skeptical that you get off on another person's body um, exactly because of this. Uh, one's getting off is... Uh, completely independent of uh, of the other body. It has to do with the way that these circuits produce satisfaction uh, that corresponds uh, with our fantasies. Mm -hmm. So what we see in Dora's case and the cough is exactly that. <clears throat> it's the way that derived satisfaction produces satisfaction constantly in correspondence with a particular fantasy. And here we see that the fantasy has to do with elements in Dora's life and situates her in a certain relationship with the other. And this is what Freud is doing in his deconstruction of her symptom. But the effect, yes, we will see the effect in terms of the dissipation of the particularities of the symptom. Uh, but, you know, many times, and this happens many times, let's say, in cognitive behavioral therapy. I hear that from patients that come and see me after going to cognitive behavioral therapy, that they say, look, I address this particular thing with my throat, just for the sake of the example, but it came back. Now it's uh, in, my, uh, in my ear, you know? So the thing is that the drive is a constant force. The particular way it corresponds with the fantasy is uh, arbitrary. It changes in our lives. And you can change that uh, and you can transmute the throat to another organ or another aspect of one's life. Uh, but the question in psychoanalysis is not how we move it around, but how we create a certain change in this particular montage. And yes, we will see changes on the level of, of, this, of the apparent symptom, but these will only be clues as to a possible effect that has happened in one's analysis. So, we aim at the drive. We aim for a change on the level of the drive. And this is what I call the body. So it's not particularly like a, it, would you call it a symbolic body? Because I, 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 that was a beautiful ex explanation. I, it, it, it just clicked in my head because uh, it's not the concrete material like or the physical body, but you said it's no, is it like the fantasy? It's something that kind of mediates between the both. Would that be accurate or... Um, okay, so, uh, again, I, I always say this, um, we have to realize that these terms, uh, imaginary, symbolic, real, are concepts that Lacan uses to assist him in transmitting something of psychoanalytic knowledge to us. They're not uh, entities in the world, mm. right? This is something to, uh, to remember. Um, <clears throat> and when we speak about the drive, uh, we can then speak about, in terms of the registers, we can speak about the way that the drive, <clears throat> um, let's say, um, expresses itself, returns, I don't know. Um, Cause you know, F Freud spoke about <clears throat> repression as operating uh, uh, on this relationship between an idea and excitation, right? So repression has to do with uh, something that was uh, too much of a satisfaction or not enough, yes? <clears throat> and then the question, what happens after it is repressed? Where does it return? So we see, for instance, uh, the the sim Dora's symptom returning on the level of the symbolic and imaginary <clears throat> because it has to do with her body and the, the, the image of the body it is situated there but it also has to do with uh, her relationship with others 
with how she is situated in the world as a woman. Uh, what does she uh, imagine it means to be a woman desired by a man? <clears throat> but uh, the drive can also return in the real. And this is what we see in cases of psychosis. Because in psychosis, we're not uh, dealing with, uh, with a repression. Freud says repression is too weak for psychos psychotics. Lacan speaks about the foreclosure. And he says, what is foreclosed returns in the real. And this is where we see symptoms expressing themselves, uh, I'll say in a stupid way, on the outside or inside. Uh, in the case of uh, paranoia, <clears throat> the drive returns in the big other, where we see the world conspiring to enjoy the subject, you see, to gain satisfaction where the subject is the object of satisfaction. So the CIA is following me. They're interested in me. This song that I'm hearing now on the radio, it sends a message to me. It tells me that I have to, I don't know, commit suicide. I don't know, something like that. So you see the drive, <clears throat> something is foreclosed, and we see the satisfaction returning as though it belongs to an other, to the big other. In cases of schizophrenia, uh, it returns in the real of the body, where one experiences the body as uh, collapsing from the inside. Uh, I think this is commonly called catatonia or catatonic schizophrenia in, uh, in diagnostic manuals. <clears throat> but this is an experience where subjects uh, feel that they are poisoned, truly that their liver is uh, made of is is turning into stone literally hmm? not uh, imagining it or it's an idea in my mind it is uh, what happens uh, and this we then we see how the drive something of the drive uh, returns in uh, this type of bodily destruction hmm? so again what I suggest is we, we think about the body in psychoanalytic terms as the body of the drive in terms of this montage of the drives, the libidinal body, as I suggest in some publications. Uh, and we can think about the way that it expresses itself or re returns after a certain repression or foreclosure on the imaginary symbolic and real level. <clears throat> but again, you see, these are just terms to describe clinical uh, phenomenon. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I need to start changing the way I think of it more or like reformulate it in my own head as being like instrumental, right? As you said, there aren't things that exist in this world, um, yes. literally, but rather they're instrumental. Um, or early on, I, I, I think I took down a few notes as uh, during explanation and there are three questions came up, but perhaps mm -hmm. I'll start with something I was going to ask you a bit later on, but since you brought up the drive uh, and you, uh, I can't find the page right now. I don't want to waste too much of your time, but uh, there's a good diagram in, in your book too about this, the, the difference between the desire and drive. Uh, and you, you had like a diagram showing it um, as to what, what the difference is. So, so yes, uh, since we were talking about the drive, what is the difference between uh, desire and drive? in the Kenyan psychoanalysis. I'm not sure what diagram you're referring to. Uh, uh, but I, let's just get to it. Why not? Hmm? Yeah, I mean, hmm. you get to it. If I could find it as, as, as you're speaking, I'll try to pull it up. Maybe maybe, maybe I've made a mistake and I'm, I'm referring to something. 154, I've taken down notes here. Maybe you mean the demand and desire. Um, but let's speak about the drive. Um, um, you know, uh, Freud speaks about the drive in his in his teaching, and it's been uh, unfortunate. Uh, so, so, it, sorry to interrupt, but yeah, you're right. It's it's. I was referring to that there. Can you see that? Oh, this guy. Yes. Yeah. The inverted eight. Yes, this one. Yeah, that is between uh, need, demand, and desire. Anyway, yes. sorry, I, I made a mistake there. Um, so go ahead, drive, drive, and desire. No worries. We'll speak about the drive a little bit. Um, 
and the way that um yeah and the relationship to desire we we can we can speak about that a little bit um so uh, i was saying that uh freud uh, well did a lot of work on the drive of course and um we use the, the, the terms to describe it to characterize it uh he was saying that the drive is a constant force he was saying that it has an aim but the aim of the drive is not uh the object of the drive. <clears throat> um, he, he was speaking about this type of movement <clears throat> that begins uh, in a certain address to another place, but then closes up on the subject itself. He spoke about this transition between sadism, masochism, and then a, a, another form of, of drive uh, uh, functioning. So Freud gave us a lot when he spoke about the drive, and I was just saying that it was very it, it was very unfortunate that in Freud's canonical translation, the drive <clears throat> is is translated as instinct. Yeah, and Freud spoke about instincts and spoke about drives, uh, instinct and trieb in German, <clears throat> and he went to great length to distinguish the two. Um, but if you open the German, you'll see that. When he speaks about the drive, which is a psychoanalytic concept, uh, he calls it the trip. Now, Lacan takes that, and <clears throat> in his 11th seminar, he provides us with what he calls the um, schema of the drive circuit. And I was thinking this might be the schema that you were referring to, because there is something to it in terms of the relationship between the drive and desire. <clears throat> And he draws it, um, I don't know, many people have have different ideas on what it is exactly. Uh, I'll show it, I'll draw, draw it here and I'll show you. Uh, some people say it's um, it's a pacifier. Some people say it's uh, like it looks like, exactly, this one, yeah. this yeah. one. Uh, it, explosion, uh, atomic okay. explosion. Um, <clears throat> I give I give a certain metaphor. It's quite poetic in the book on what, what I think about it um, uh, in terms of <clears throat> that, that I draw from um, <laughs> tent building. Uh, I know today nobody builds tents out of sheets because uh, you can buy <laughs> quite a good tent um, made of, of nylon, but <clears throat> If I remember myself as uh, being younger, I, I used to do that, to build tents out of sheets, and you had to connect the sheets uh, to, be, to build a bigger tent. And we came up with this system where we would put two sheets, one over the other. And, you know, if you just tie them together, it wouldn't be strong enough. It wouldn't hold them. So you put two sheets, one over the other, and then you take a little rock and you place it underneath, and then the two sheets cover it. Are you with me? I'll bring a tissue. <laughs> I've never done a, a, a real demonstration of, of how to do it, but maybe our listeners will profit from it more than the rest of the, so of if the talk. If you're on Spotify or a listening platform, go on YouTube and you'll see the video of uh, Leon's <laughs> okay. live demonstration. <laughs> So I have this little drum I got as a present uh, from uh, a friend from Brazil. She brought me this drum. So I'll use it as a rock. Hmm? So if you take the sheets, let's say these are two sheets, you put the rock underneath and you see now I can sort of fold the two sheets over it. I'll have another. So here they are two sheets. And what I do in order to connect them, I'll, I take a little rope and I tie it underneath the rock. And then you see the rock holds them together. So if there wasn't a rock inside, they wouldn't hold together. They would break apart. So you need the rock. You need the rope. And you see here is a little uh, diagram of what you see, what you've just, what we've just seen. So a real life uh, enactment of the diagram of the uh, drive circuit. If you ask me, I see. So would the rock be the object? Object? The uh... exactly, exactly. So we're getting there. Yep. Excellent. So. <clears throat> Um, for, um, for Lacan, the circuit of the drive is a very unique um, 
thing in uh, our libidinal economy because it is able, um, and this is the term that he use, uses to, <clears throat> in, I won't use the French, but the French uh, means both to go around but because it does, it goes around as we see the drive goes around. But it also makes a trick. It tricks, so it tricks something of the real uh, into the symbolic. And the drive does that. <clears throat> it does some impossible feats if we think about these two uh, sheets. Uh, because these two sheets, they represent two sort of incommensurable uh, stratas, let's say, uh, in the psyche. And the drive, through its movement, is able to make something <clears throat> that uh, is composed of the two. I think, this is my personal opinion, that this diagram is sort of a precursor to Lacan's interest in not theory, noting, uh, because a not is a very interesting figure. Uh, and again, we go to, we speak about Boy Scouts today. huh? Uh, if you went to the Boy Scouts, you know that there are many, uh, or they call the Scouts today, I think. Scouts. Uh, when when I scouts. Scouts, uh, it changed it. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> for good reason. Yeah. So, um, so you learn that there are many types of knots, right? Some are very aesthetic, some have different qualities. And what is interesting about a knot is, uh, let's say you make a knot out of two ropes, and I made a little knot out of two sheets, but let's say you make a knot out of two ropes, um, <clears throat> you tie them around each other in a very intricate way, and then you create a knot and it is unique. The knot is something that is more than the two ropes. Right? It has a quality that does not exist in the two ropes themselves. Yes. Uh, on the other hand, it is not more than the two ropes. It is, a, it is the two ropes. There, there is nothing in the knot more than the two ropes. Now, this sort of excess level, this dimension that is created through knotting that exceeds the two ropes, but is not more than the two ropes, <clears throat> is exactly that trick, I think, that Lacan is referring to when he speaks about um, the drive circuit. Now, the trick has to do with exactly with what you just said, with the objet a, with the object cause of desire. Because the drive moves in a circular way, it is a circuit. It comes back to the source. So it goes out of the erogenous zone, out of the orifice, and it goes around and it comes back to the source. I'll give you an example <clears throat> um, that shows you that, that the drive is not the instinct, right? Um, when we go to a restaurant, let's say, we are instinctual animals, let's say, we have a certain hunger and the organism operating according to the pleasure principle it starts feeling a certain discomfort when we are hungry. So we go to a restaurant, right? And we order some food. And as you eat the food, this discomfort then turns into comfort. You're not hungry anymore. So this happens again a few hours later and you go to a restaurant again. That's if you're rich, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you eat and you're not hungry anymore. So you see, I'm describing a certain sinus wave here. This is the organismic rhythm. <clears throat> homoestasis, a concept that Freud didn't invent, but spoke about before it was invented, when he spoke about the pleasure principle. <clears throat> so you're hungry and you go to a restaurant and you eat, and you're hungry again and you might have a sandwich at home. But this is not how things work for us, right? We are hungry and we go to a restaurant and we eat, and we're not hungry anymore, but we order a cake. And maybe we order a little ice cream. Yeah. And then just to finish it off, I'll have a little shot of, I don't know, I'm in a Greek restaurant, so I'll have some ouzo. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. And you see that what, what continues beyond the sinus wave, this little pocket, this little pacifier, this little atomic explosion, is what we call the movement of the drive. The drive is what 
operates <clears throat> beyond the instinct, right? The instinct is a need for to, to, to eat, and we satisfy this need. But a drive goes on. And when it goes on and continues to move beyond the sinus wave, beyond the notion of homeostasis, it marks out something in its circular movement. Something is marked out in the middle. This is the rock that I was speaking about. And when you look at this little tent and you see these, this rock uh, bulging from the, the tent, um, well, that is something completely different. You uh, maybe you, maybe, and this is again just for the illustration. You start asking yourself, "What is it? What is it there that makes me uh, go around and around and around and around?" And you might start speaking about it and thinking about it, and even maybe in your life, attempting to fill it up and uh, with different objects or different things, etc., uh, etc. Et and this is where desire comes into the into the. Uh, the stage onto the stage uh, because the objet petit a the object cause of desire is the condition for desire because it is a placeholder it is not an object like any object in the world and i cheated a little by showing you that my uh, objet a my my petit objet is a is a drum Yes, it's a little drum, yes, but that's not how things are, right? Um, the Auger A is exactly um, something that doesn't exist. It's a placeholder, it's a lack. Mm -hmm. And desire operates in this sense like a, an endless metonymy, an endless attempt to say, well, that's it, that's it, but not, that's it, but not, that's it, but not, that's it, but not. So you see that the movement of desire, the metonymic movement of, the, of desire, is conditioned on the operation of the drive circuit. When the drive circuit uh, closes up on itself and establishes a certain repetition, then something of the OGA escapes that domain and enters the symbolic and imaginary domain. And this is what this is where we can start thinking about it, conceiving it, and uh, saying something about it in analysis. <clears throat> uh, sorry, Leon, I, I don't think I got the part what you meant by it escapes into the symbolic domain. Do you mind elaborating a bit more on that? <clears throat> um, it becomes uh, something with uh, a consistency. It uh, takes uh, form in our in our reality as a pain in the throat as an obsession with um, trains as a fantasy to get rich you see it starts getting a consistency that has to do with the reality that we live in yeah? Uh, which is uh, symbolic, uh, but also imaginary. Of course, yeah. I mean, this is, uh, in fact, I think uh, Todd McGovern, in his book, uh, Capitalism and Desire, uh, he he touches on this quite a lot, like in the in the symbolic, this, uh, the objet, it exists in, in, in um, kind of the neoliberal capitalist world. And in many ways, his whole point is, uh, the way capitalism works is by not working, in the sense that it doesn't really give you what you want. But by not giving you what you want, it's paradoxically working. Uh, Todd does great work with that. Yeah, excellent work. And also, it's just just because I think you put it beautifully here, uh, on page 185, just for the listeners, you say here, um, the, the fact that the object is not attainable means that draft satisfaction is always partial and makes the thrust revolve around the object indefinitely uh, as a constant force. Accordingly, not only can we characterize the satisfaction of the drive as never reaching its object, we can, we can also say that drive satisfaction is directly derived from the failure to reach it. 
And I, I highlight, highlighted that bit and I even annotated it saying capitalism and desire because Todd has a very similar, he obviously brings the drive into the kind of our social reality and he theorizes at that level. Uh, and I thought that was a interesting sort of uh, isomorphism, let's say. Um, you know, where, where Todd has this, uh, <laughs> I love this example. And I love Todd's books. Um, and particularly, I love the way he's able to take these sort of very daily experiences in order to illustrate so those these very intricate concepts and he uh, he exemplifies this idea when he speaks about the show the wire i don't know if you've watched that show i haven't i know i know what he had talked about but i haven't watched wire unfortunately it's a very good show it's a very good tv show um but todd says that the trick about the wire and this is why it is um so much uh different than uh uh, what we are used to today in terms of binging uh, YouTube, etc. Uh, the trick about enjoying The Wire is not watching uh, four episodes in a row. Is that it is realizing that it is actually watching one episode a day and then letting it simmer, letting you sort of fantasize, sort of enjoy the expectation for the next one. That is uh, that is the way to do it. Uh, and yeah, it's a way to enjoy uh to enjoy um, limitation and to realize that, well, this is how things operate on that level. So that's a very interesting example that Todd gives. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, uh, also, uh, interestingly, I'm, I'm a big uh, R&B and hip hop fan. And uh, Michael Michael Diamond, so from the Theory Underground, those guys, in, in the one of the uh, blog posts, I'll, I'll link it in the descri description down below, uh, Jay-Z has this song called on to the next one, on to the next one. And he, he for Michael, at least, he theorizes that this song perfectly illustrates uh, how uh, the, the, you know, the object works, where it's, it's metonymous, as you said, it's, it's all forever elusive, forever out of reach. But that's yeah. where the enjoyment lies in always moving on to the next one. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought that was quite interesting. Um, uh, or really, in fact, I don't know, I, forgive me, but I have to ask, I'm a hopeless romantic here. So if in that theory, in that psychoanalytical theory, how would you explain something like the phenomena of love? Uh, you know, like how, how, cause like in some sense, you know, like the, the love object, if you quote unquote, get the person to put in a crass way, then the satisfaction is gone. The enjoyment is gone now. Uh, so it's just, just, I'm just curious uh, from, from your view, how you explain the phenomenon of love or, or perhaps you would you don't believe in love i mean i, I don't know <laughs> so uh <laughs> i might say uh <laughs> it's interesting you mentioned this because i am just writing a book about love that uh, is supposed to be published uh, in a few months well i'll be the first to pre-order it uh i mean if you're asking uh the current working title is uh, uh falling in love with uh lacan and badiou Ah, yes. I love uh, uh, Badiou's, uh, my, my, one of my favorite books, uh, In Praise of Love, which also I've got somewhere here. Yeah. It's, a, it's a great book. It's a great booklet. Um, <clears throat> and it has a lot to do with what you we were speaking about and this type of satisfaction. And you gave the example of um, Jay-Z. It's a good one. Um but maybe we can go to the way that <clears throat> Lacan exemplifies this type of satisfaction when he refers to the paradox of Achilles and the turtle. Do you know this one? I, I do. I'm not, not familiar with this one. It's it's a very um, famous pa paradox from uh, <clears throat> ancient Greece. And uh, it speaks about Achilles, who is uh, uh, the most talented um uh, a most talented uh, athlete in uh, ancient Greece. He's a very impressive uh, athlete. And uh, he decides one day to have a running competition with a turtle. You know? Is this Zeno's paradox? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, yes, yes. I'm, I'm familiar. I'm familiar. In fact, uh, sorry to interrupt you on this. I'm reading this book uh, by Hofstadter. 
Kerala Shabak. I don't know if you. Oh. He goes into this uh, Zeno's paradox quite a lot, but more in the realm of logic and mathematics. So I'm curious to hear yeah. what your Lacanian take on it is. So, sorry to interrupt, but keep going. We're going to get to mathematics. Yes, this is the point. Um, so Achilles decides to uh, uh, to have a competition with a turtle, but he's you know he's um, kind of a he, he has sportsmanship. He's he's telling a turtle, okay, you can have a head start. You know, I'm so good. You're a turtle. Take a head start. So let's imagine that the turtle takes a head start. Let's say he's about a hundred meters ahead. And Achilles waits until he's 100 meters ahead, and only then he starts running. So at this point, Achilles has to cover 100 meters yeah, until he gets to the turtle. And he does that in a certain amount of time. Let's say it takes him a minute. Uh, but in that time, the turtle doesn't remain in place. He doesn't wait for Achilles. He continues. right? So the Achilles covers 100 meters, and at that time, the turtle does another 20 meters, let's say. Okay, so Achilles has reached point A where the turtle was when he started running, but now the turtle is in point B, right? So Achilles has to cover this distance. That's 20 meters. <clears throat> so let's say Achilles covers that in, I don't know, um, two minutes, okay? And well, while he covers that distance in two minutes, the turtle doesn't wait for him at point B. He continues. And in this sense, he goes another five meters, let's say. And as you see, Achilles now has to cover five meters. <clears throat> so let's say he does that in half a minute. But in this half a minute, the turtle still doesn't wait for him. He moves. So let's say the turtle moves 50 centimeters. The Achilles now have 50 centimeters. He covers it, but the turtle doesn't wait. So he moves two centimeters. Okay, now two, he doesn't wait. He moves half a centimeter, 10 millimeters, 10 micrometers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The idea is that Achilles never reaches the turtle. The turtle never does. Yeah. You know? This is uh, the paradox. Okay, of course, mathematics has solved it in a way today, but it <clears throat> exemplifies the way that a certain, power, a certain type of satisfaction operates for the human subject. It is a satisfaction that is always established in relation to an inaccessible infinity. <clears throat> we always aim at it, but we never reach it. But only by trying, we gain satisfaction. You're speaking about Todd. Todd speaks about the object A as uh, <clears throat> establishing satisfaction only when a, um, a boundary or a obstacle is put in place. Right. So it's only when you cannot reach the object that you enjoy it. It is only when the object is unreachable that we can assume that it is this uh, unimaginable prize that we're aiming at. As soon as you buy the iPhone, it's not it, right? And this is why Apple releases every few months a new iPhone. So we'll continue chasing the turtle. It is the chase that provides us with the satisfaction. It is the um, browsing of the catalog of binoculars in the attempt to find the perfect binoculars to use in order to uh, spy on your neighbor, to catch your neighbor in the shower, I don't know, which is the source of satisfaction. Seeing your neighbor naked, that's not it, according to this idea, because you've done it. Huh? It is the what you do in the way, what you do on the way, what you do <clears throat> in aiming at this turtle, this unreachable turtle, that provides you with satisfaction. The turtle here, here is objet A. Uh, this is, for Lacan, later in his teaching, only a particular type of satisfaction. He calls it masculine satisfaction. It's interesting. He associates it with the masculine subjective position, which is nothing like uh, what we would call a male or someone who would be identifying as a male or someone who has done a transition to being a male or one gender or object preference, it's not the case. One can be <clears throat> straight, gay, LGBTQ+, plus. it doesn't matter, and still, I, I still achieve this type of satisfaction in relation to an inaccessible infinity. 
Lacan calls this masculine. It calls this the jouissance of the idiot, the satisfaction of the idiot, let's say, because it is always done in relation to an object, an object of fantasy. And this is why I told you, Raoul, that you probably, and I'm just guessing here, do not enjoy the other's body, even when you make love. You make love to an object. I assume. Maybe I'm wrong here. I don't want my partner to... Uh, my, I don't want my partner to hear this. <laughs> Maybe uh, they should hear it. I want to keep this confession away from her. <laughs> <laughs> it's important to face the truth, even when it is uh, horrible. But then you can do something with it. Huh? Let's keep on enjoying her. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't recommend anything uh, other than that. This type of enjoyment uh, we can associate with what we classically we associate with desire. Hmm? Desire works in this way. Right? Desire works by keeping on sliding on the chain of signifiers. It's not this, it's not this, it's not this, as JC was saying. On to the next one. <laughs> on to the next one. Uh, but for Lacan, <clears throat> there is another type of satisfaction that he develops later in his teaching, which is a, 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 a some type of a step forward from Freud. Because for Freud, there was only one type of satisfaction. There is a masculine satisfaction, a masculine libido. And then whoever is a woman, and for Freud it was a woman, uh, uh, can either, you know, uh, copy it or be jealous of it or reject it uh, but that's it Freud was saying I, I I really don't know what's going on there with women uh, he said that feminine enjoyment is some type of a black continent this is what he said in a very un, uncontemporary way but for Lacan there is another type of satisfaction that he associates with the feminine position uh, in his psychoanalysis. And again, feminine has nothing to do with, you know, your particular gender, object preference, etc. It's the question of, do you have access to this other form of satisfaction, or are you solely disposed to the satisfaction of the idiot? Now, I don't know you, Raul, personally enough, so I'm not calling you an idiot, a complete idiot yet, but only I, a partial idiot. Yeah, <laughs> so, I mean, Zizek says there are two kinds of people, though, total idiots and idiots, so I'm, I'm not sure which one I am either yet. Yeah. This is exactly what he means. Yeah. He means that there are some people that only enjoy in relationship to this inaccessible infinity, and there are those that can enjoy this way, but also in another way. <clears throat> and this way has to do with what Lacan calls feminine jouissance. And then another point, he associates it with love. This is what my book is about. <laughs> okay. What is it exactly that we can say about love when we think about it in this way? Hmm? Now, Badiou has a very interesting quote. Uh, and I, I very much agree with him on this. And he uh, uses, uh, it's a quote from the New Testament that he changes a little bit. He says that love goes through desire like a camel through an eye of a needle. Mm, yes. Very, <laughs> very figurative, ah, uh, even a bit uh, obscure. Hmm? Uh, but in a way, it says that love has to go through desire even if it is an impossibility. So love then is a, is a certain impossibility that one acts upon in their lives. So it's not a matter of elaborating. You cannot say anything about it. This is why I tell you, the way. I don't believe in a sign of love. Uh, because, you know, you buy your girlfriend flowers. Okay, does, does this mean that there is love? Hmm. It is, uh, it is nothing. It is just a gesture. How can you know? You cannot know. You can never know that love is in fact at stake. And maybe in retrospect, you say it was not love. Or maybe in retrospect, you say it was love and I missed out a chance. Huh? Uh, but when you are in love, you make a wager uh, an, on, on, an, on something that is impossible to know. 
And well, now we diverge from Lacan and I, I go more deeply into this in, in my book, but for Badiou, the question is what you do with this wager in your life. How does it change your life? Uh, what is this wager is exactly a wager that whatever satisfaction you are, that whatever satisfaction materializes in your life through this wager is not idiotic. This is basically the wager that you are not an idiot in the sense of enjoying solely in a relationship with an object. You are saying whatever I am wagering on has to do with an other with a, let's say, a pure alterity within, with, 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 a, with an otherness that is completely beyond my capacity to fathom. And it, this is why, you know, uh, I think Badiou says this, to love well, mu one must not understand. This goes against the whole uh, idea of couples therapy, huh? Compatibility and all these, yeah, I know, I know, yeah. Against, against Tinder and, every, and all these apps, right? Yeah. One must not understand. Yeah. And if you can, from this not understanding, create something in your life, something that is uh, materially expressed and is based on this hypothesis that there is the I and the idiot, but there is also the other. And, there, and between us, there is this love and you do things in your life and it changes your life and the world starts to build itself from this perspective this is for but you what what we might call a satisfaction uh, that is achieved in in love no i beautifully put it on in fact i i, I want to ask you that something i'm i'm going to be the first person to pre-order your book when it's out so <laughs> i'm going to keep an keep be, be keeping keeping an eye, eye eye for it um you know but you also talks about where uh love is like a project it's a newer truth you create and he always says love involves a separation and then involves two. Yes, and yes. for me, and my reading of that is it's important for love to involve two, because if you say love is like two people become one, in some sense, the otherness is completely uh, eliminated. And exactly. then it's kind of like a narcissistic form of self-love, or as you said, a total idiot just pursuing some object. Whereas mm -hmm. you, there always has to be the element of otherness in love. Um, mm -hmm. but nah, uh, so, so when, when you reckon the, uh, uh the book is going to be end of this year or next year or. Yeah. And end of this year, hopefully. Yes. I think that's, that's I'm what we're in. I, I, I don't know. If, I don't know if, if you mentioned this in our previous conversation, but this deeply excites me <laughs> that they're, they're writing a book on love. Yeah. Cause I, I'd say, uh, Todd McGovern also has a beautiful theory of love, uh, in his, he, uh, in emancipation after Hegel. He he hmm. talks on this. Uh, Bajou and McGovern, both Lacanians, uh, they have, in my view, the best theories of love that I've I've read uh as a as a idiot. So it's really been beneficial. Um early on, let's see what time wise. We've gone for almost an hour. Can you give me about 15 minutes more? Is that is that okay? Your time? Yeah, let's let's do 15 more minutes. Cheers. Thank, Thank you very much. Because I do want to ask about foreclosure as we missed out last time on that too. Um, I, okay. Uh, obviously you're doing the the course with the, the theory underground guys. So I was going to ask you about these subjective structures or clinical hmm. structures. Uh, the big ones are neurosis, perversion, psychosis, but that mm -hmm. you, you can't cover all of that in 15 minutes. I totally understand, but uh, perhaps I'll, I'll ask uh, in, in this way. Um, let's talk about the, uh, subjective structure you introduced in this book, the, uh, autistic subject. And then you, 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 you state in, in many parts, but specifically in page 149 about how, uh, for, when it comes to foreclosure, uh, autistic foreclosure is different from psychotic foreclosure. Uh, so if I could put this question in a, let's say a bipartite way, can you perhaps give a very elementary just for the listeners of what what really you mean by these subject when I mean you I mean more Freud and the Lacanians uh, mean by these subjective structures and mm -hmm. then how based on those you've developed um uh, uh the autistic sub, sub subjective structure uh, apropos foreclosure sorry that's a very uh, long-winded question but it, it, I hope that make, make, make sense 
Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think we spoke about this last time when I was saying that uh, these categories, these uh, clinical categories, these diagnostic categories, we call them structural, if we speak of a structure, are in fact, if if we um, if we uh, try and understand what is their function is that they are function as coordinates for the conducting of an analysis. So basically, we might say they are ethical categories uh, in what uh, we call the direction of the treatment. So. Uh, Neurosis would be one direction of the treatment. Psychosis is another direction of the treatment. And we differentiate them because it is important that the treatment will be different, that analysis will be different in a very, uh, in a very uh, deep way. Uh, so on a surface level, it means that an analyst, analyst uh, an analyst and, uh, working under the hypothesis of neurosis uh, would have a particular type of speech, a particular type of intervention. Transference would unravel in a particular way and it would be different for uh, psychosis. Uh, and for perversion, and what I offer in the book is sort of the idea that it would be different for autism. And so basically I'm saying <clears throat> that autistic people cannot be treated like psychotic or neurotic people in psychoanalysis because it's uh, un not useful and also sometimes dangerous. Um, now, when we speak about metapsychology, we speak about a certain elaboration of what does it mean? What does this structure mean uh, psychologically? And this Freud went to great lengths to do in his papers, and Lacan also took it up. Uh, but you can see that already in Freud, where he speaks about uh, uh, these structures in, in distinction between <clears throat> what he calls this underlying mechanism that uh, puts these structures in place, and then the effect, the compensatory effect after this mechanism. Basically, we're speaking about repression here. So Freud speaks about repression. So he says, well, repression is the cause of neurosis. When one is, uh, uh, when one relies on repression of a certain form, something is, uh, something uh, unravels uh, on the psychic uh, uh, in the psyche that um, establishes a certain relationship with reality that we call let's say neurosis and we handle it in the in in psychoanalysis w what freud says though and this is what what i go to great and extend in the book to 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 demonstrate is that these diagnostic categories can be distinguished uh, not on the basis of apparent symptoms. This would be the compensatory secondary reaction to the mechanism. And this would mean, for instance, uh, hallucinations, uh, delusions, um, or um, obsessions, uh, etc. Hmm? Uh, <clears throat> Freud says that if we focus only on this level, we will surely conflate these diagnostic criteria, and it's true. Neurotic people are quite delusional. Um, they sometimes hallucinate. Obsessions uh, also take part in psychosis. So if we only focus on this, and this is what's happening in the world of psychiatry, yes, then Freud says already quite early, before 1900 even, he says we will confuse the two. So he says the way to distinguish between these structures is to pay attention to these mechanisms, to this repression. <clears throat> and Freud says, that if we find evidence for repression, then we can assume an erotic structure. And he tries and see, he tries to see, well, how, can I identify different mechanisms? And he speaks about, for instance, a rejection uh, in German, a fair verfuhr. And he says, well, I identify this rejection and he really goes into the metapsychology of it and he distinguishes it from repression. He says, well, repression entails taking an idea and an affect and, and separating between them, <clears throat> inscribing the idea and the unconscious and the affect remains floating. 
And he says, well, rejection in the case of psychosis operates differently. Rejection completely annihilates an idea and an affect and the accompanying affect from the psyche altogether. Uh, and he says, oh, this is when we see delusions and hallucinations attempt to fill up, to fill up this gap with content, to, to explain it. This is what a delusion is, an attempt to explain a hole uh, that gape, is gaping in one's uh, reality. And Freud says it, it is the task of the analyst to pay attention to the, the working of these mechanisms in producing a diagnosis. What I do in the book is I do the metapsychology of the autistic mechanism. And the thing is that because historically speaking, autism has always been conflated with psychosis, and not for terrible reasons, there is a lot of symptomatic overlap. We see in, in psychosis and autism, a certain problematic with the use of language, uh, some uh, phenomena that has to do with body, body issues, situatedness in the body, etc. There's there are many uh, overlaps there. But what I do in the book is try to develop a metapsychology of the autistic mechanism and to sufficiently uh, distinguish it from the neurotic and psychotic mechanism. And by doing that, providing evidence for the necessity of developing a singular clinic for autism, one that is not the clinic of psychosis and not the clinic of in neurosis. So this is basically what I do in the book in terms of these uh, mechanisms and what you speak about autistic foreclosure, this is what I call it. Um, in a way, regretting it, you know, I could have thought about that, a nicer term, a, a new term. Everybody likes to invent concepts, right? But basically, I, I, I called it foreclosure because I identified some, some similarities in its uh, mode of operation. Uh, is a mechanism that I assume is the, if we can speak of cause, because we don't speak so much in terms of etiology in psychoanalysis, but we can say that it is the cause of, of autism. Um, we can say that autism is the way the subject spontaneously treats autistic foreclosure. <clears throat> And the same sense as I say that neurosis is the way that the subject spontaneously uses to treat repression. Because no one in, in humanity in this world is a healthy person, is a person that comes into this world um, <clears throat> in a sufficient way. We are all insufficient but we rely on a particular mode of existence, a mode of understanding, a mode of being, in order to compensate for an inherent insufficiency in, in any human. Neurosis is one way to compensate for it. Psychosis is one way to compensate for it. Autism as well. And in psychoanalysis, we don't ask ourselves how to cure these uh, way, ways of being, modes of being. Uh, we ask ourselves, how can we facilitate uh, these modes in establishing a change in one's life? Or let's say establishing a relationship with reality that would bring someone some satisfaction and freedom hmm, uh, that will get them to say, um, well, maybe it works for me and to some extent today. Freud says, turning profound suffering into an ordinary suffering. This is another way to look at it. Yeah, in fact, in a couple of your lectures slash podcasts you just mentioned, and I, I mean, I thought it was put quite plainly, it's just to alleviate suffering. I mean, it, it's not a the kind of complete panacea, but by the very fact that it could alleviate suffering that itself at least for me that like that's that's enough you know though life as hard as it, it is already um uh so and then but you are you are claiming leon i mean i don't know if you have time for this but then if you could outline a little bit the the, the specific differences between psychotic foreclosure and then what you are you developed uh autistic foreclosure 
Yeah, so just be because of lack of time, I won't go into the <clears throat> sort of very dense structural analysis I offer in the book, but I'll just say what to me is the, the major distinction uh, between the two. And <clears throat> for me, the major distinction is the fact that while um, psychosis hinges on a foreclosure uh, of something that has profound effects on one's capacity to rely on language in situ situating oneself in the world, this is how we do it, right? <clears throat> it has effects on this, on the capacity, it um, shifts the weight of one's subjective dynamic towards the imaginary rather than the symbolic. So there's a certain emphasis on the imaginary in the uh, reality of, of psychotic subjects, the psychotic subject is still disposed to the big other on many levels. Uh, we see it in the delusions, uh, the big other is there. Um, but also we see it in the fact that psychotic subjects have access to the domain of signifiers. In a way, they're um, much more in tune with the functioning of the signifiers than neurotic people. Uh, Lacan let us read Joyce in order to see it, and it's true. If you open Finnegan's Wake, you'll see uh, a masterwork with signifiers, but you also see it in, uh, in the Institute in what psychiatrists call associative looseness. And this is some type of a speech that is solely focused on the phonemic level so you see someone starting to speak uh, and make sense. Yesterday I went to the super and wanting to say supermarket, but then continuing Superman has just flown out the window. So you see that what we see here is a certain play with signifiers. And this is how many psychotic delusions work. Uh, and we see it in this type of speech that is called associative looseness. So psychotic subjects are disposed to the use of signifiers and they use them in a unique way, and in analysis, we work with that. So many times it is quite poetic on this level. Mm. What I argue is that autis autistic subjects or autistic foreclosure uh, enables a mode of existence that rejects the domain of signifiers. So it rejects the big other in this sense. Uh, autistic subjects to me, do not rely on signifiers in handling of their reality. They rely on a different linguistic unit that I call, well, after Lacan, it's called the sign. And it's different than the signifier. It has different dynamic functions. It has different characteristics. And I think this, if we have to sort of put our finger on the major distinction between the operation of these two mechanisms is what linguistic space do they open up uh, for the subject. So for the psychotic, foreclosure opens up a linguistic space that is the space of signifiers, but it is, but it, then the psychotic leans in putting these signifiers to work uh, in an image. Huh? Uh, so uh, very briefly, I mean, uh, <clears throat> a, a psychotic, uh, parent will latch on to the image of what is a family, but will not have the capacity to symbolically uh, situate themselves within it. So let's say a family is a mother, a father, and two children. And if the father leaves, it is a catastrophe. The world crumbles because one is focused on that level. <clears throat> For an autistic subject, um, the linguistic domain is emptied out of signifiers but it's full of signs. And the question is what one does with a language of signs. And this is the question of analysis uh, with uh, autistic subjects. So this is the distinction uh, that I would, I would say is important here. I think uh, you've given us some good pointers. Obviously, read the book, read the book. That's, that's all I can say. I, I read it 
Well, I read it once and then I read read half of it again for this podcast, especially the bit on foreclosure. Um, excellent. Uh, I think that's a great place to uh, end it, Leon. I, I, I'd i love to, uh, as I said before, probably do another one once your book on love is released. Uh, who knows? It could be uh, I'm planning a few trips to uh, Berlin this year. Uh, well, I'll be there. Oh. In, I'll be there in June. But then also my surely we will meet then. Exactly. End of the year. And it could even be an in-person pod. Who knows? <laughs> but uh okay. looking forward to it. Yeah, that's that's great. I, I I'm very, very grateful for your time, Leon. Thank you so much. And thank you for your work, uh, your your teaching, your public teaching uh, for you know idiots like me. <laughs> yes, and, and there is some idiocy to it as well, to my teaching as well. <laughs> so I hope I hope you picked up on that as well. Um, but yes, yeah, so um, I'm looking forward to see you then and um, virtually and not <clears throat> and in person. Hopefully, yeah, we'll keep in touch. Yeah, yeah. It's funny you said you said when the previous episode when I introduced you and I brought up your book, you said uh, idiots write books. <laughs> so, well, that that was that, that was fantastic. Yep. All right, Leon. Thanks a lot.